Hello and welcome to episode number 202 where I'm speaking with Tracy Stanley about her book Radiant Rest, Yoga Nidra for Deep Relaxation and Awakened Clarity. We talk about this ancient practice of deep relaxation and rest which allows you to tap into your creativity and intuition. So please stay tuned. Welcome to the Elements of Ayurveda podcast. I'm your host, Colette, and I hope to educate and empower you to take charge of your health and well-being, preventing disease in the body and mind so that you can thrive in life. I will be sharing the holistic teachings of Ayurveda, which is the ancient healing tradition from India. I will also discuss topics like yoga, which is the sister science of Ayurveda, and various topics under the umbrella of holistic health and planetary health, as well as interviewing lots of inspiring people along the way. My humble wish is to help you to connect to your true nature and to Mother Nature. Now, if you're new to Ayurveda, I recommend listening to the first couple of episodes where I do an introduction to Ayurveda and the mind-body types. And if you like the content, please be sure to subscribe or follow the podcast so the new episodes will automatically download for you. Also, you may want to check out my private elements community, which is away from social media. It's a safe space for like-minded people to come together, to connect, to share, to support each other, and to continue the conversation from the podcast episodes. Check out the link in the show notes or visit my website, elementshealingandwellbeing.com and just click on the community tab. And I hope to connect with you there. Thanks for listening, and now here is a new episode. This episode is sponsored by Banyan Botanicals. During seasonal transitions, it's especially important to stay on top of your health. My listeners know I love drinking Banyan Botanicals CCF tea year-round to support my digestion, and I was thrilled to learn about their new Tulsi Fields CCF tea blend. It infuses CCFT with the fantastic sattvic powers of Tulsi leaves, sourced from Banyan's partner farm in Oregon. This blend tastes delicious, smells divine, and is so uplifting, even brewing it is a magical experience. Banyan is one of my favorite Ayurvedic brands, and they offer even more drink mixes, teas, and other items to support your health. Banyan products are sustainably sourced, organic, and fairly traded, and their website has really helpful content and resources, including their celebrated dosha quiz you can take any time to check your state of balance. Savor Tulsi Fields and other amazing Banyan products and save 20% by visiting banyanbotanicals.com forward slash elements dash podcast. You'll also find that link in the show notes. That's banyanbotanicals.com forward slash elements dash podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Elements of Ayurveda podcast. Today, I'm very happy to introduce you to Tracy Stanley, founder of Empowered Life Circle, sharing teachings that are inspired by more than 20 years of study in the tradition of the Himalayan Masters and Sri Vidya Tantra. The focus of her teaching honors life as a ritual, and she is devoted to yoga nidra, meditation, self-inquiry, nature as a teacher, and ancestor reverence. She is the creatrix of the Empowered Life Self-Inquiry Oracle Deck and host of Radiant Rest Podcast, which celebrates the practices, teachers, and traditions that prioritize the rituals of rest, sacred dreaming, and self-care. Tracy's book, Radiant Rest, Yoga Nidra for Deep Relaxation and Awakened Clarity, is published by Shambhala Publishing and is available now. Tracy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Colette. I am so happy to be here. 
Well, I am happy to have you here, Tracy. I'm looking forward to this conversation today because we're going to talk about your new book, Radiant Rest. And I'd love to start, Tracy, with Yoga Nidra's origins and a little explanation about the practice. Yoga Nidra is translated most often as the yoga of sleep. Mm. And we think about it as this way in which we can consciously enter the state of deep sleep, where we really allow the thread of consciousness to remain awake and aware through all of the states of consciousness between waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and even moving towards the portal of what is known as the fourth or Turiya, which is uh, considered to be a stage of Samadhi uh, mm. that is also considered to be peace beyond words. So a lot of times we think about yoga nidra as a technique, as something that we do, um, as we also do yoga, right? We think about, mm. oh, we're going to do yoga. And yoga nidra is not only a technique, but it is a state of consciousness. Mm. And Yoga Nidra is also a goddess that is written about in the Devi Mahatmya, um, which is an ancient text. And so if we think about Yoga Nidra as this technique that leads to the state of consciousness that is peace beyond words, and that it is also presided upon by this goddess of Yoga Nidra that is the Shakti of repose, the Shakti of rest, um, that it really is a full and complete system of yoga in and of itself. And the only asana that we need to practice in this practice of yoga nidra is one where the body is completely comfortable and fully supported by the earth. So yoga nidra is a lot of things. And I think that when you start to learn about yoga nidra, there's usually one portal or another, whether it be the technique, the state of consciousness, and maybe even some of the science behind the brainwave states or the, the beauty of the stories of yoga nidra that kind of lead you deeper in um, to understanding a little bit more about the practice. Beautiful. Well, thank you for that explanation. And I know it's a, it's a vast subject, which I want to definitely ask more questions about. Um, but I'm also interested in your journey because you mentioned in your book that you left a high stress career to share the empowering practices of yoga nidra. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey of discovery with yoga nidra and how it has impacted your life? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I discovered and was introduced to the practice of yoga nidra in 2001 um, at a time when my film career um, was really starting to take off. I used to be a Hollywood film producer. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was also um, about six or seven years deep into a very dedicated yoga practice um, and in fact, I had decided that I wanted to open a yoga studio that was run on donation um, so that yoga could be accessible to more people. Mm. Um, and so I was introduced to this practice. It was not um, actually really introduced. It was just kind of like, oh, we're going to lay down and I'm going to lead you through a practice. And during that practice, I had such a deep uh, kind of knowing inside of me that there was this stillness and peace and bliss that I had not experienced before. Mm. Um, the closest that I could really come to having had that experience would have been doing an hour and a half of dynamic asana and dynamic yoga and then lying down for 15 minutes in Shavasana mm -hmm. and allowing the mind and the body to just kind of almost feel like it was dissolving. But I had never had that experience without having any kind of movement prior um, to the practice. And so it was something that I started to really bring into my own practice 
Um, the teachers that I was studying with at the time would always end the asana classes with um, yoga nidra or some sort mm-hmm. of deep relaxation practice. And so after a while, I kind of found some information about deep relaxation and yoga nidra and a few scripts. And I started to share those practices um, in my classes that I was teaching on the weekends. And what I started to notice that it was like this simultaneous thing where I was getting this huge benefit because I had a very demanding job where we would work often, you know, 14 or 16 hour days Mm. and that I could practice yoga nidra and feel refreshed and feel as though I had slept for eight hours. And not only did I feel more refreshed, but I actually started to feel as though I had more clarity. Mm. Um, You know, so for me, when I first started the practice and I first started sharing it, it was really more about the technique and kind of using the technique to achieve an outcome, which the outcome was deep rest. And as I continued to learn more about yoga nidra and continue to share it, um, I think my ability to touch into some of the deeper states of consciousness started to evolve. Um, and then when I started to learn more about the symbol of Om and how the sound of Om is also a gateway into these states of consciousness um, mm-hmm. by reading various translations of the Mandukya Upanishad. And of course, I, you know, understood and understand probably like 1% of what's actually in the Upanishad, but it's enough to start to allow for me to think about um, these states of consciousness and the mantra Om and the practice of yoga nidra in a different way than I had before. Um, So I think the answer to the question is really through time and through practice my embodied understanding of the practice of yoga nidra, the state of yoga nidra and the goddess have evolved and they continue to do so. Mm -hmm. Um, I really feel like it's kind of, you know, a lifelong, maybe many lifetimes um, of practice uh, to be able to just explore, which is why I love it because every, experience of practicing yoga nidra is completely different Mm. and unique beautiful thank you for the sharing that and it's so true the the sciences of yoga and and ayurveda and like you said yoga nidra that it's like an ocean of knowledge as we say in ayurveda it can be a lifetime and like you said many lifetimes of learning and going deeper into these studies Exactly. I mean, I feel like um, I'm really a student Mm -hmm. of yoga nidra. Mm -hmm. Um, The practice is the teacher. And, you know, that's, I enjoy going to the feet of the teacher every day to experience uh, whatever she has to offer for that day. Mm, beautiful way of putting it. And you mentioned when you were speaking there that that feeling that you got of the mind dissolving. And you talked about in your book how yoga nidra is a yoga of dissolution. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So my understanding is that yoga nidra is a laya yoga practice, Mm -hmm. laya yoga being the yoga of dissolution. And, you know, I think that really most yoga practices are meant to bring you from the identification with name and form to really understanding and knowing your true nature. Mm -hmm. And yoga nidra is no different. It moves your awareness from the most gross being our physical body to the most subtle. And we do that by taking a journey kind of through the koshas Mm -hmm. Um, the koshas being the sheaths or the layers that cover the light of the soul Um, as well. That covering kind of keeps us in this place of forgetting Mm -hmm. that we are light. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And so yoga nidra then is also like a smirti practice. It's a practice of self-remembrance. Mm. And that self-remembrance requires a dissolving of all the things that we think we are, whether it's over-identification with our thoughts uh, or with the body. And so when we start to move through and, you know, we can talk about it in a linear way because because the koshas is kind of a linear model, but it doesn't mean that the practice itself is linear, mm-hmm. right? Because yoga nidra, let's say the state of consciousness is not something that um, we can make happen. Mm. It really descends by grace, right? You're not going to, I mean, anybody who's practiced meditation knows like, I'm not going to make myself stop thinking, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or I'm not going to make myself not be aware of the body. Mm. But through these practices where we learn to surrender and we, we learn to observe the resistance to surrendering and we learn to trust little by little, we can allow that awareness of the body to dissolve and we Mm. become more attuned. And I would say, more sensitive to our prana Mm. and then eventually that sensitivity just matures into an awareness Mm -hmm. which allows us to surrender even more Mm. and eventually prana can guide us back to source beautiful because all those resistances have dissolved so um, that's just one way of thinking about it. Mm. Um, you know, it really, it really is this beautiful um, dissolution of everything that is not true. Yes, like you said, weighed down by by external stuff sometimes, and it just allows us to go through those layers. And dissolve mm-hmm. them. Mm. And for any of the listeners out there who are not familiar with the koshas or the the layers, the sheets of the body, I cover that in another episode, and I'll link it here for you. So just if in case you want to review that. And Tracy, you talked about the types, different types of yoga nidra practices. Can you share with us a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, I mean, I think what what I spoke about in the book is really. Um, First of all, going back to this idea, right, that we can't make yoga nidra happen, Mm -hmm. that all of these various techniques that we are practicing that we call yoga nidra are actually just preparation Mm -hmm. for receiving the grace of yoga nidra. And so I think a lot of times what happens when we get these techniques that have different names, right, or it's like shatali karana, um, or, um, you know, 61 points, these practices are ancient and they relay back to the wisdom of Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. They relay back to the wisdom of the Marma points, Mm -hmm. right? And then sometimes what happens is because of different traditions being very dogmatic, they get kind of concretized into a technique and that this is the only way Mm. that you can do the practice. Mm. And if you vary from the practice, it's not correct. And so I I love the idea of kind of going back to um, some of the original wisdom, um, you know, Shavaratra, some of these uh, practices like Shitali Karna, which basically means to loosen effort. Mm-hmm. You know, it relates to these points in the body and the parts of the body that are also related to the elements. Mm. And so when we're bringing our awareness up, so this practice of Shitali Karna is kind of like you start from the soles of the feet and bring awareness all the way up to the crown of the head as the body is breathing in. And as the body breathes out, you're moving awareness from the top of the head to the soles of the feet for, you know, 20 breaths or something. Mm. And then you're moving that awareness from the ankles. And then eventually you're moving it from the knees 
and then from the hips. And what we're doing is we're actually dissolving the part of the body that we're no longer bringing awareness to. Mm. So each part of the body starts to dissolve and be released as the effort is loosened. Um, And there are many ways in which to do that. So I try not to get caught up in there's, there's many different types because I think there's many different ways in which we can receive the grace of yoga nidra that have nothing to do with a prescribed technique. Mm -hmm. Um, I've had, you know, first of all, Swami Veda Bharati um, writes in one of his books, and I believe the name of the book is My Experiences with Yoga Nidra, um, that he, as a like 12-year-old child who was going around the country in India lecturing because he had translated the Yoga Sutras and was a child prodigy, mm-hmm. but was also very ill and kind of sickly as a child, figured out a way to allow himself to basically move into the state of yoga nidra. And it wasn't until he was 30 something years old and he met his teacher that he was introduced to the formal practice or technique of yoga nidra. And then realized that he had been doing yoga nidra practically his whole life. Mm. And I've had that also with other students who have come to yoga nidra workshops or classes And they've then said, oh, I've been doing this since I was little. This state of consciousness is very familiar to me, or this place that I go to and this deep relaxation is very familiar. Mm. I've been doing this my whole life. So I do believe that there are um, more than just a few ways and techniques to, uh, to allow ourselves to prepare for this state of consciousness. Mm, yes, absolutely. And as in Ayurveda, we have different constitutional types, different practices may resonate with different people, you know, different needs at a particular time and so on. So I like the fact that, you know, that you're more open to the the flexibility rather than following a rigid system. Yeah. And, and it also means that we can, and I think this is, is also um, a little bit kind of a post-lineage approach to it. Mm. Um, But then it opens us up to being able to observe the seasons. Right. To observe what's happening with the lunar cycle, Mm. to observe what's happening in our own body. Mm. And that the more we experiment and we receive many different techniques, we really have kind of a tool bag then that we, if we continue to practice and know what the effect of each, you know, nidra is for us or each uh, deep relaxation is, then we get to be able to be more informed. Yeah. Because we have a embodied wisdom around it. Exactly. And Ayurveda too, it's all about connecting with mother nature. I know in the bio, you mentioned you, wanting to help people understand that nature is a teacher. So rather than saying, I have to do this practice today is more the awareness of how am I feeling today? What stage is the moon? What stage am I in my cycle? What are my needs today? And choosing from that place rather than this is the practice I have to do today. Exactly. So it means that the practice is then is not prescribed. The Mm. practice is actually responsive. Mm. And if I know that I, need and desire a grounding practice for myself. Then I also know that I can go outside and I can lie on the earth Mm. and that the earth then becomes an ally and a teacher and a supporter for me in my practice. Mm. That's wonderful. Absolutely. And using what you have around you, you don't necessarily need a a studio being okay to use what you have available around you and and nature being a a perfect, a perfect place to practice as well. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't, I don't believe we need a studio, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) Right? Because if we think about the Rishis and the Rishikas, Mm -hmm. they were not practicing in a yoga studio. 
Mm. And I think that that's limited actually our uh, ability to expand our practice in some ways when we're only practicing in a studio. I agree. I agree. And it's limiting the integration of the practice into our own lives and also being empowered to feel our our body and mind that day and again what it needs uh, when we're just going to a specific teacher led practice exactly exactly mm-hmm. and and i think that you know you said teacher led i think that really at some point when we um have the ability to self guide ourselves in these practices specifically practices like yoga nidra and deep relaxation um it takes on a different tone. Mm. Something shifts. That's what mm. I what I feel and have experienced in my own practice. And because as a teacher who teaches um, yoga nidra to people who want to offer it as a as a practice to others, that is like one of the things that we make sure that people do is learn how to self guide. And when that happens, their practice takes on a whole new um, kind of dimension. Beautiful. It's like a deeper integration of the practice. Right? 100%. Yeah. yeah. And if, if we think about yoga nidra is also a pratyahara practice, mm. right? And, and pratyahara being the withdrawal of the senses so mm-hmm. that we can reassimilate into our true nature. If we're constantly listening to the audio, there's still the sense of hearing that is there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm going to interrupt here because I want to talk about bringing your body and mind into balance so that you can really experience these deep states of rest and relaxation. Ayurveda recommends cleansing and particularly at the joint of the seasons. Now we just went through the autumnal equinox here in the Northern Hemisphere. And so this is a really good time to do a cleanse. Ayurveda recommends cleansing at the joint of the seasons from spring into summer and then from summer into autumn because there can be an accumulation of toxins from the previous season and also an accumulation of doshas which can lead to aggravation. And if we don't cleanse, we bring this into the next season and it can create further aggravation and illness as well. So taking this time out to give the body some easy digestible foods, there's no fasting with Ayurvedic cleanse. You're eating your three meals a day, but it's really foods that's easy, digestible, whole foods, natural cleansing, and then bringing in self-care, mindfulness practices, yoga to have a holistic cleanse. I will be hosting a group discounted seasonal cleanse starting October 1st. This cleanse comes with a 90 minute one to one online consultation with me so that I can check in on your current health status and also tailor the cleanse to you. If you're interested in joining this cleanse and entering the new season feeling light and clear and energetic and preventing illness by boosting your immune system, then click on the link in the show notes or visit my website elementshealingandwellbeing.com and visit the events tab for the October 1st group discounted cleanse. If that date doesn't work for you, you could do a private cleanse and you can find the private cleanse under programs. I hope you can join us. We'll go through the October 1st group cleanse in a group format. There'll be a community of international people there to support you and to hold us all accountable as we cleanse our body. So I hope you can join us. And now let's get back to our conversation with Tracy. And you talked about preparing for a yoga nidra practice and Obviously, it can take uh, that can take many forms. Um, but in your book, you you discuss that. Can you share a little bit about that here today? Yeah. So, so I feel like it's um, everything we do mm-hmm. <laughs> is preparation for yoga nidra, um, and that can be anything from doing gentle movements, right? Um, knowing that where the vayu or the wind of the body that will be most active um, is the apana vayu, Mm -hmm. right? Because we're moving down and wanting to be close to the earth. Um, So just doing some forward folds, 
um, practicing mantra, mm-hmm. um, you know, practicing Abhyanga. That's one of my favorite things to do is to actually do Abhyanga um, before Yoga Nidra mm-hmm. and keep the oil on my body, especially in the winter. Mm-hmm. Um, and then practice my yoga nidra and then rinse off afterwards. Beautiful. Um, so there's many, many different ways. And I think that it really is about um, knowing, again, knowing what you need. So movement, mantra, meditation, journaling, all of those can be uh, preparations for yoga nidra. Mm. Um, using nausea oil, using abhyanga, um, you know, with the proper oil, with a heavier, a heavier oil mm-hmm. um, can be really helpful. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. And in Ayurveda, I'm sure you're aware, we talk a lot about the dinacharya, the daily self-care practices and putting in morning and evening routines and how beautiful to have an evening routine where you're doing that calming of the nervous system with the Abhyanga oil massage, the withdrawal of the senses, and then going into yoga nidra practice before bedtime. How blissful is that? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, in training, we we go through a month of Dinacharya. Oh. Um, and it is, you know, the, between the Abhyanga and Nazia oil, mm. um, it's just, it's divine. Yeah. It takes the practice to, to a much more nurturing, soothing, supportive, restorative practice mm. than mm. sometimes how it can be offered. And we have to give ourselves permission to be able to move beyond uh, the dogma of um, maybe how we learned it 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And to be able to really ask myself and ask yourself, how can I support myself even more? Mm, absolutely. And especially in our world today, if you're coming home after a day out and about, just trying to deeply relax in yoga need to practice without some form of calming the nervous system first can be quite challenging. So going through those rituals, the Dinacharya, the Abhyanga, the Nazia oil and so on can bring you to that place easier and Mm -hmm. and create a more calming environment. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so with that calming environment and, and deep relaxation and rest, this allows us to really tap into that awareness that you talked about, tap into that creativity and that intuition, right? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. And so, you know, the practice of yoga nidra is really about, um, well, one of the things that it's about mm-hmm. is staying awake and aware in the transitions. Mm-hmm. Right, which is usually the space that we kind of check out, right, or we fall asleep. Mm-hmm. And one of the other definitions of of nidra is ni, meaning void, and dru, meaning to draw forth from. Mm. And so, if we're awake in these liminal spaces, you know, in the hypnagogic space of that space between being awake and sleeping, then we get to mine what's there. And Mm. that void space is full of infinite potential. It's full of wisdom. It's full of creativity. It's full of inspiration. And it's one of the reasons why um, I feel like self-inquiry and free writing or journaling immediately after practice is so important Mm. because it helps us to amplify our smirti, our power of retention, our power of memory, Mm. the power of self remembrance. And that is why we practice. And when we're in the busyness of the day and we're just in our yoga nidra, and then as soon as it's over, we hop up and do the next thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't allow us to have the space to really cultivate creativity and inspiration. 
Um, and so I know from my own personal practice and I know also from being uh, a guide to others and encouraging them to free write that there have been books and poetry and new workshops and realizing that careers needed to end and other things needed to begin that mm -hmm. come from really paying attention to that space and honoring and savoring that liminal space. There's so much wisdom there. Wow. Yeah, so true. And there's so few opportunities that we have in our busy lives because we're always on or connected. So creating that space is important, I think, to allow that inspiration to come in. Yes, it is. And I think, you know, just going back to that thread around the yoga studio mm. is that the yoga studio model, at least the one that I uh, was kind of brought up in in the States, was really like, you come in, you do the practice, and then there's like a class of 20 people standing outside the door buzzing to get in while yeah. you're in Shavasana. Mm. Yeah. So you there, you there is no time for you mm. to savor that liminal, to savor mm. and remember. Um, and I think that that's something that as teachers, we really um, should think about just that that liminal space is also part of the practice, mm. right? The practice yeah. doesn't just end because we've done the last pose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The importance of just being and, and honoring that. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So true. So true. And is there a particular time of day in regards to the circadian rhythms? Is there a particular time of day that is, is, ideal or does it is it just person specific or, or what do you suggest in that regard mm, i think it's person specific mm -hmm. um for me i i first of all i think that we each have to tune in to understand what our personal rhythms are mm -hmm. which sometimes um because of the work day being kind of imposed upon us as a mm. nine to five, we didn't, we never really have gotten the opportunity to know what our, our daily rhythm is. Right. So for me, I know that, you know, I like to wake up early um, and that's my time to be creative. Mm. And I know that yoga nidra amplifies my creativity. So I will do my yoga nidra practice first thing in the morning mm. Um, there are some people who like to have yoga nidra in the afternoon as a way to refresh and restore themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a person who once the sun starts to go down, I'm transitioning into uh, ending my day. So I'm not working. I'm not trying to look at the internet. I'm not trying to do, you know, work. I'm trying to do things that are really more in the service of me having a deep and peaceful sleep. Mm. Um, so I will practice a version of deep relaxation um, to allow my body to release you no know, tension, allow my mind to release, um, bringing awareness to my heart and just repeating a mantra as I go to sleep as part of my sleep hygiene and my mm -hmm. sleep practice. Um, so I think there's many ways in which yoga nidra can be helpful. And I think the more that we practice and that we give ourselves permission to listen to our own intuition as to when and how we need it, then we get to use the, the practice um, and our life becomes a practice, right? That's mm -hmm. Because we start to integrate these tools as though they are just the same thing as brushing our teeth, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? right? Or taking right. a shower. It mm -hmm. just becomes part of uh, part of how we honor ourselves and take care of ourselves. Mm, yes, absolutely. And taking responsibility for our own self-care and our own health. Yes. Yeah. And you mentioned sleep there, Tracy. Do you recommend yoga nidra as a tool for people who are having sleep problems if they're waking up at, during the night? You know, the technique can de of deep relaxation can definitely be very helpful for people who have insomnia. Mm -hmm. So I know 
quite a few students who have insomnia and they use the practice of yoga nidra to allow them to move into sleep. Mm. And I think the the wakefulness around uh, observing the states of consciousness somehow allows them to notice like when the breath changes, Mm. when the body starts to shift and when that portal arrives where you can drift off into sleep. Mm. Other people I know who have insomnia um, have used yoga nidra where they will just do three or four or five yoga nidras during the night one Mm -hmm. after another, they'll just continuously practice a yoga nidra, like different, you know, four or five different yoga nidras because they know they can't fall asleep. Mm. And they use that as a way to be refreshed and to be relaxed. Um, And also probably not to be thinking about the fact that they can't fall asleep. Right. Um, So, so it can be, and, you know, used for, for insomnia, Mm -hmm. you know, the practice is really meant um, to wake us up to our life, Mm, right? right. We're not actually using it to fall asleep. But Mm. if you have insomnia, who am I to tell you not to use yoga nidra as a way to fall asleep because we need to sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would say use the practice to, to fall asleep. But if you can thread a little bit of awareness in that practice, even where when you start to notice that the body is ready to fall into sleep, you can say to yourself, the practice of yoga nidra is con- is complete. Now I'm moving into sleeping. So mm. that you create kind of um, it, uh, almost like a, a, a new vasana around the fact that you actually can bring yourself into the state of sleeping mm. and that you're separating the practice of yoga nidra the spiritual practice of waking up to your life and who you are and your true nature from the practice of finding a way to fall asleep. Yes. Yes. Well, that that certainly makes sense. Absolutely. And so Tracy, if people are interested in starting a yoga nidra practice, what would you recommend? How would you recommend that they start? They begin that journey. You know, I think the, the best way to start is to, uh, find an audio yoga nidra practice that you like Mm. and start to practice with that. So, you know, in my book, Radiant Rest, um, it actually comes with audio practices, Mm -hmm. um, whether you buy the book or the audio book, um, there's a link inside the book on page eight. So you can immediately start doing practices on your own. And I think that that is the easiest way, um, especially during this time of the pandemic. You yeah. know, if you're fortunate enough to be in a place where um, you can go to a class outside or a class, you know, at a studio, then, you know, find someone who is practicing yoga nidra, is teaching yoga nidra. And sometimes it takes finding a few different people because, you know, a person's voice might not resonate with you. Mm -hmm. Um, The level of practice, I think, is really resonant in how a person is offering yoga nidra and how they talk about yoga nidra. So you really have to find just like yoga, you know, regular kind of yoga asana, you have to find someone who really resonates with you. Mm, yes, it's very personal, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, and if somebody is practicing, especially now, if there's COVID restrictions, if they're practicing in their home, how would they create the right environment for practicing yoga nidra? Mm. You know, that's another thing that I think is also personal. Mm-hmm. Um, the most important thing is that the body is supremely comfortable. Mm. So being able to understand what your body needs to be supported. And it's surprising that a lot of times we think we know, and then we get down into the position and we start doing the practice and we're like, oh, my knees, I should have put something underneath my knees or my Mm -hmm. back or my Mm -hmm. head. And so what I often ask students to do is to set up their yoga nidra nest 
as though they are setting it up for their most beloved. Mm, I love that you call it a nest. <laughs> it's beautiful. That that and that actually comes from Uma Dinsmore Tuli. She uh-huh. she was the first person that I I heard refer to Yoga Nidra nest. And so if mm-hmm. you think about a nest, a mama bird is going to go and get every single thing mm-hmm. that can be there to help support and protect the babies. So if you set up your nest as though you are setting it up for your most beloved. You will go and you'll get that extra little thing. You'll get that extra scarf to cover the eyes. You'll get those extra pair of socks to cover the feet. Mm -hmm. You may light a candle. You'll make sure that you turn the lights off. You may even tell everybody in your house, hey, I'm going to be doing something. I need quiet and not to be disturbed for the next 20 minutes. Mm. You'll do those extra things. Though That's how you kind of protect your space and how you set up your space because it's a sacred practice. And we're very open when we're in the practice of yoga nidra, because remember we talked about this idea of dissolving the layers. Mm -hmm. So you want to create a sacred space to be able to lay down and to receive all of the beauty and magic from this practice. Mm. Absolutely. And in a world where we focus a lot on doing and not on being, that it's also so important for us to set up those times where we have this this space and time just for this relaxation, and that it is as important as the food we're eating, the exercise we're doing, and all those other self-care routines, that this deep relaxation again, is where this inspiration comes from, right? And and can be a very powerful portal for us. 100%. I mean, I, I recommend to people when they are starting their practice or they want to explore the practice of Yoga Nidra to dedicate themselves to doing it consecutively for 40 days. Mm. And that 40 days includes, so that practice would include just three to five minutes of free writing or journaling after practice. Mm. I will guarantee you that your life will be much different if you practice this for 40 days consecutively with free writing afterwards. Mm. There's no question about that. Yes. Just allowing yourself that space just to, yeah, that, that space in between. Right. And, and, and if we think about it, you know, yoga nidra is this quality of spaciousness. It's like Mm. Bhuvaneshwari, Mm. this quality of space, this quality of expansion. And who would you be if you were more spacious and more expansive? You would be more yourself. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, this is very inspiring, Tracy. So I'd love for you to tell people where they can go to find out more about you, your new book, Radiant Rest, Yoga Nidra for Deep Relaxation and Awakened Clarity, and your offerings. Oh, thank you for asking. Um, So you can go to radiantrest.com and you can also go to empoweredlifecircle.com. Those are the two best places to find me. And um, thank you so much for having me. Tracy, thank you so much. I really enjoyed chatting with you today. I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you as well. Have a great day. Take good care of yourself. Thanks again. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Tracy and that it has inspired you to check out Yoga Nidra if you haven't already been benefiting from that wonderful practice. Please check out the links in the show notes for Tracy's sites radiantrest.com and empoweredlifecircle.com. If you think that this episode will be helpful to family or friends, please share it with them so we can spread this wonderful wisdom. And if you would like to join the October 1st Discounted Seasonal Cleanse, just click on the link in the show notes or visit my website, elementshealingandwellbeing.com and click on the events tab. I hope you can join us 
for that seasonal cleanse. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast or follow the podcast, please do so. And if you would like to rate and review the podcast wherever you listen to your podcast, I would really appreciate that. Thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, take good care of yourself, be well, and bye for now. Slongafold.